Hi Neha, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Recording in order.
निन्ना अरे उसको उरी को बुला के लाने मेरी तैयारी स्टार्ट नहीं हो रही मीटिंग
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी अभी आर वेटिंग फॉर द पैनलिस्ट तो वी विल स्टार्ट शॉर्टली मॉर्निंग मैम Manju, ma'am, are you here? Ah, Manju, ma'am. Neha is here. Ah, Manju, ma'am, are you there? So, okay. I mean, I think all the panelists are here. Uh, yeah, very good morning to everyone. So, if I go, I am uh, audible, right? Very clear, sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much. So, uh, warm welcome to all the panelists here. And uh, here we are, the Wetland Authority of Delhi and WWF joining hands together for the first time to kind of uh, celebrate the World uh, Wetlands Day. And um, just uh, to introduce the agenda of uh, today's discussions, I would like to tell you that uh, the Wetland Authority of Delhi was constituted in uh, Delhi in 2019, uh, two three years back. and uh, the mandate of the wetland authority was strictly as per the provisions of the wetland rules 2017 so the rules came up in 2017 and the authority was constituted in 2019 two years later and uh, i mean uh, we have been actually strictly going by uh, the provisions of the wetland rules uh, religiously so uh, what we have done and we have attained much progress in uh, four of uh, to five verticals as per the wetland rules one is the listing business so in the listing uh, area vertical we are kind of listed 1043 wetlands i mean so far and uh, through various uh, data sources uh, be it uh, the two member uh, committee appointed by the high court of delhi or uh, be it the um, space application center inventory or through uh, discussions with stakeholder departments who kind of um, come up uh, proactively and kind of tell us that they got so many uh, this uh, wetland in their jurisdiction so these are the different uh, data sources through which we are kind of inventorized and compiled a list of 1043 Uh, water bodies and among these water bodies i mean uh, the wetland rules also speaks about a digital inventory so towards the direction we have ensured that uh, i mean through field teams we collect uh, geo coordinates from all the uh, water, bo water bodies and kind of map them so out of 1043 we have uh, geo mapped around 1020 uh, 1014 uh, 1014 wetlands uh, in delhi and majority of these water bodies belong to dd and as we all know as i mean all the panelists of esteemed uh, members and uh, highly uh, I mean, uh, experienced speakers so uh, we all know that brief document is kind of the flagship document that needs to be prepared uh, that needs to be prepared for each water body so each water body and uh, uh, and these brief documents we are in the process of preparing for the last 6 months and uh, since it's a very scientific document an ecological document which contains uh, scientific criteria about a detailed criteria about each water body uh, we had to uh, assist the land departments there are around 20 water land departments in delhi so kind of coordinating with them has been a very big challenge and um, we had been able to actually uh, sit with them kind of uh, build their capacities to prepare this brief documents so i'm not saying that the brief documents are very high quality documents but yes we got signed documents of the land departments acknowledging that this is a water body which belongs to them and that is the first stepping stone towards long term conservation of any wetland in the country and uh, so uh, out of 1043 we have been able to kind of Uh, I mean, um, uh, prepare brief documents around 680 water bodies. So almost more than 50% of the uh, water bodies in Delhi, we have been able to prepare brief documents. And uh, since uh, Wetland Authority is a very um, not a very well-staffed uh, 
body. Uh, there's a society called the Delhi Parks and Gardens Society, uh, which is actually uh, formed uh, to look after parks and gardens in Delhi. So that department has been given the uh, mandate of assisting or offering secretarial assistance to the wetland authority. So we don't have any dedicated staff. So whatever jobs we have done so far has been plainly due to collaboration. So collaboration in the sense that we have uh, a very strong technical committee uh, in place, uh, which is also another provision of the wetland rules. So that has been headed by um, and, uh, Madam Madhu Verma, and uh, it consists of around six wetland experts, including uh, Dr. Ruthish Kumar today, who is here today. So uh, they have been very instrumental in kind of helping the wetland authority screen these brief documents, because screening brief documents is a huge job. And uh, there are around 600 brief documents which need to be screened. So Tekken Company has been very generous enough. They have been very busy people. Still, they've been generous enough in kind of screening through all these brief documents. And uh, number two, uh, when the wetland uh, Asia, wetlands international South Asia have been our knowledge partner since inception. And kind of they have been also been very uh, graceful in kind of helping uh, us uh, in offering technical assistance whenever we need help. And then recently we have also joined hands with WWF in kind of um, in, uh, strengthening our citizen engagement uh, initiatives, especially on the uh, creation of awareness pillar. So I mean, uh, uh, it had been their very strong point in kind of engaging with various stakeholders, which has also been instead and incidentally the theme of today's discussions. So uh, they're strong, we have to try, try to tap, tap, tap in on to the strongest point that is engagement of stakeholders. So citizen engagement, we are actually uh, I mean, I mean, uh, partnering with WWF India and we're happy to have them also on board. Uh, so our um, long-term vision, the Wetland Authority of Delhi, is trying to actually bring all the water bodies in the landscape of Delhi under the legal umbrella, under the statutory framework, so that we offer them long-term conservation, long-term protection. And also in a parallel, we kind of uh, um, offer technical assistance to all the land departments in kind of scientifically restoring water bodies and uh, not through crude engineering interventions. And uh, the third, uh, so there are these three pillars which are working. One, the legal protection, Number two, the technical assistance. And number three, the citizen engagement. So uh, the biggest uh, I mean, uh, weapon of our citizen engagement has been this uh, Wetland Mitra scheme. So through Wetland Mitra, we have now engaged or declared 91 Wetland Mitra so far in Delhi. Actually, I mean, they have been recently approved by the government and they have not gone big on uh, uh, on engaging the wetland mitras very productively, productively. So that's why I requested Suresh Papa that let's in today's uh, wetland uh, day celebration, why not we kind of discuss how to engage wetland mitras and other stakeholders as well, and kind of get ideas on how to engage wetland mitras in long-term conservation of wetlands. So having said that, I welcome um, Madam uh, Manju Pandey, uh, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forest, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Manu Patnaka, INTAC, Director INTAC, uh, Madam Neha Sinha, uh, Head Conservation Policy, uh, Bombay Natural History Society, and then uh, Suresh Babu, of course, uh, Director from uh, Worldwide Fund for India Nature. Uh, and I hope that uh, your expertise and your uh, valued inputs would be instrumental in uh, us drafting a very good stakeholder engagement plan, especially for the wetland mitras and kind of engage this wetland mitras more productively uh, in, the, uh, in the wetland landscape of Delhi. Thank you so much. Now I request uh, Mr. Suresh Babu, uh, WWF India, to kind of kindly moderate the sessions. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Jayachandran, and uh, um, for uh, sharing the highlights of the State Wetland Authorities initiatives in uh, Delhi, and uh, also uh, for giving us an opportunity to collaborate with you and all the experts uh, uh, from Wetland International to INTAC and others who had been supporting you in this journey on wetland conservation. Um, I'm very excited to have this uh, uh, very esteemed panel, and uh, all of uh, uh, all of the the panel members have been engaged in Delhi for quite a long time. And uh, so what we are really looking at, into is to get your inputs in developing uh, an implementable uh, action plan uh, for stakeholder engagement. And just to clarify here, you know, when we are talking about stakeholder, there is a lot of emphasis on wetland mitras and uh, local stakeholders and communities. But also we are looking at people who have influence and have a huge 
uh, huge impact on wetlands as well. So they, they may not be necessarily the local communities, but maybe industries, maybe other government departments, etc. So in your intervention, if you could also share uh, with you, uh, with uh, with uh, us, your experiences on engaging those stakeholders whose influence is very high and whose uh, actions can impact uh, a lot on the wetlands, both positively and negatively. And second, of course, the local communities, you know, who had been uh, a great support in some of the initiatives uh, that, uh, you know, many, many organizations, you know, who are present in this uh, call have been undertaking in terms of wetland conservation. So how do you sort of help those groups who had a great support for the cause to come up in the, the ladder of influence? to change behavior, to change policies and, and practices. So that's number one. So, uh, you know, we have a great range of expertise from here. You know, uh, uh, I'm a, a extremely uh, honored uh, uh, by the presence of uh, uh, Manchu Pardee, ma'am, you know, who had been driving uh, the renewed strategy of the MOEFCC in terms of wetland conservation. And she's a great believer of uh, strengthening the capacities at different levels, particularly the state wetland authorities, and also uh, championing the cause of uh, local institution building and stakeholder engagement. And she has uh, been instrumental in uh, rolling out the Wetland Mitra program uh, last year as a part of the Bharat Gambut Mahotsava. So we'll hear from uh, Manju ma'am about, you know, how uh, the, the the, the vision behind this program and also, you know, what are some of the lessons emerging and what Delhi could do uh, in, in strengthening this engagement with uh, local stakeholders. We also have uh, um, an, an Neha Sinha, um, who is a head of conservation and policy in, uh, um, uh, in uh, BNHS, but also had been uh, associated with the Wetland Authority in Delhi for quite a long time. And she had been, through her writings and through her lectures had been inspiring local stakeholders to undertake biodiversity conservation as well as monitoring. So we'll hear from Neha as well, you know, what, what, what are some of those engagement possibilities and how we could actually inspire people to come, come on board around that. Manu Bhatnagarji, you know, uh, he's uh, an urban planner and very, very uh, well known, had been working on Delhi's water issues for quite a number of decades now. One of the key things that I, I found interesting is that he had always been looking at an engagement opportunities with uh, urban uh, planners as well as the urban water utilities. And uh, he has said that you know, urbanization is like colonization of watersheds. And if you don't really look at urbanization, you know, any, any change in uh, uh, wetland conservation and health status is really difficult. So we'll request um, Manu Bhatnagarji to focus on how we could uh, strengthen our engagement and also inspire some of these planners and people who are outside the wetland box to adopt uh, some of the principles of wetland conservation in detail. Ritesh had been an ardent uh, uh, advocate for integrated uh, wetland conservation planning, looking at synergies between stakeholders, looking at synergies between various departments, dovetailing of programs, etc. So we will hear from Ritesh briefly on, you know, how some of those synergies can be built in and what kind of strategies we need to engage. We also have Ashish Loya. Ashish uh, is a graduate from Bits Pilani. Uh, he had been in, uh, in US for many years and he left everything to be back in Bijnor and he is a uh, real Mitra of uh, Hyderpur, one of the recent uh, Ramsar sites, and he had been uh, looking at documenting uh, various dynamics of wetlands, particularly looking at the bird diversity over, over seasons, its dependence on water, and also had been building a lot of uh, uh, capacity on the local ground, you know, at, at, at the local level. You know, he had been uh, looking at uh, people, sorry. Uh, looking at uh, identifying local stakeholders, local youth, and training them on uh, some of these initiatives as well. So we will hear from uh, Ashish uh, as well as to how uh, we could inspire and motivate individuals to come forward. And there are, uh, I was told that there are many Mitras, wetland Mitras who have signed up for uh, Delhi's uh, wetland conservation in here. Um, just before uh, I hand over to Manju Ma'am for her inputs, I just wanted to flag three areas of stakeholder engagement. And this is something that we are planning to work with all of you and uh, uh, under the guidance and leadership of Dr. Jay Chandran to put together a stakeholder engagement plan. We are looking at a, an annual plan uh, for, uh, for engagement, which will look at three pillars. One is uh, informing and consulting the local stakeholders, which will look at awareness, sensitization, and feedback loop on wetland. 
Wetlands. We look at influencing and inspiring people, which is about capacity building and behavior change. We are also looking at collaboration at the third pillar, which leads into conservation action. So in your interventions, if you could touch upon you know, your expertise and the experiences in each of these three pillars, that will be really helpful. And also any other pillars which you feel are missing from, from this. And last but not the least, what we are looking at is to create uh, you know, shared vision for various stakeholders at a local level uh, for, for protection of wetlands within a sub-basin or, or, or a watershed, how we can bring people together to own up that vision and work towards its, its conservation. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll stop and I will request uh, uh, Manju ma'am um, to, uh, to enlighten us about the ministry's initiatives around uh, stakeholder engagement and also on the capacity building initiatives and particularly focusing on you know, what lessons we could learn for Delhi uh, to take this uh, program on wetland mitras forward. Over to you, ma'am. And thank you for your time, because oh. uh, you told me that it's a busy day for no, you, no, but uh, still you found time for this. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, Suresh, I would just request, could you put me a bit later? There's just a parliament question which has come on second, and madam asked me to look at it, and we have to submit it in the next 15, 20 minutes. So I'm right. uh, okay. working on that. Uh, I'll. Um, this is on, the webinar is on. I'm hearing what's happening. I'm doing my work. I'll join you a bit later if the others could start uh, first. I'm okay, sorry for uh, the inconvenience. It is, this no, has just come up suddenly. Not at all, not at all. And so we will move on to the next speaker. And thanks, thanks for being with us uh, on the call, ma'am. Thank you. We'll look forward to hearing you later. So I'll request uh, uh, Manuji to come in here. Ma Manuji, uh, if you can hear me because I can't see Neha uh, Sinha on the call yet. So I'll move on to uh, Manuji. Manuji had been working on various uh, aspects of wetland conservation in Delhi, particularly uh, both on restoration processes, governance, as well as engagement with stakeholders. So if you could hear your perspectives on, you know, how we could build the stakeholder engagement plan and operationalize it for making a difference on the wetlands. Over to you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, I'll just put on a you know brief presentation, which is a bullet pointed one. Uh, how do I share this? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I hope the presentation is uh, visible. Yeah, it is. If you could make it full screen. Yes, I made it yeah. full screen. Yeah, yeah, we can see it clearly. So, just scroll down. So basically, you know, the uh, public at large uh, has so far uh, not uh, viewed uh, wetlands with uh, some equanimity. They have, uh, while in earlier times, uh, wetlands uh, were uh, seen as uh, sources of sustenance. But over the, uh, you know, last few decades, as uh, piped water supply began to make its mark, and uh, uh, tube wells uh, came in in large numbers. Uh, wetlands uh, became actually a recipient, uh, you know, of uh, uh, wastewater and uh, sewage, and that uh, of course led uh, them to uh, look ugly, uh, become uh, you know sources of disease and so on. So people began to look at them in a uh, adversarial manner, and also the value of land went up in the last uh, couple of decades, last three decades rather, in an explosive manner. So, uh, well, water could come from anywhere, but land uh, had a huge monetary value. So uh, that is how wetlands began to uh, become, uh, you know, shrunken and uh, many of them were lost. So the first thing I think is a need to orient the stakeholders towards uh, the values of ecology, of hydrology and biodiversity right in the midst. And how all uh, these water bodies are connected to uh, larger issues of sustainability and uh, human psychology and so on. So I think uh, one of the tasks uh, of the stakeholders uh, or rather the wetland committees which we are talking about could be to reorient uh, uh, the stakeholders towards uh, these uh, values. Uh, now, at uh, who are the stakeholders actually? 
So before uh, I come to that, let me, of course, look at wetland typology. And so the bulk of uh, Delhi's uh, wetlands are village ponds. And uh, then, of course, we have a few natural lakes like uh, Balaswa and uh, Najavgarh and uh, uh, Sanjay Lake, uh, Harinagar Lake. Then we have some tanks like Hoz Khas, um, uh, Hoz uh, Shamsi. And uh, we also have some check dams in the ridge areas. Uh, we also have uh, quarries in the uh, uh, old mined areas of Asola and Bhati, which are now becoming large water bodies. And the heritage water bodies, of course, uh, uh, not only Hoskas and Hos Shamsi, we have uh, one or two others, uh, really major ones, which uh, are lying rather unknown. Uh, then uh, in recent days, uh, the Delhi uh, Gel Board has proposed using its treated, uh, tertiary treated uh, effluent uh, to make uh, large water bodies within the uh, large campuses of their uh, sewage treatment plants. And then we also have potential uh, water bodies, uh, which you know uh, could be made in different places, in a sense as a compensation to what we have lost. Now, if we look at the stakeholders, who could they be? So these should be adjacent communities in which RWAs could be prominent. Uh, many of the you know uh, enthusiastic youngsters from the villages. And ultimately, all these villages are, uh, you know, going to be in urbanized uh, area as per the Delhi uh, 2041 draft master plan. Uh, then, you know, of course, yes, it's good to have enthusiastic amateurs, but then I think some element of uh, uh, science uh, professionals uh, who know the subject uh, should also be uh, part of those uh, committees. A landscape architect would be very useful because uh, I think it's not merely a subject for, uh, you know, uh, ecology and limnology, but also about urban aesthetics, the aesthetics of the landscape. Many of these water bodies uh, do harbor uh, or provide habitation to birds and migratory birds. And so birders could also be uh, 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 part of these committees. Uh, there could be people who fish or those who indulge in sports angling. They could also be uh, useful members of such committees. And since nothing can function uh, effectively without uh, government representatives, so I think the owner agency should be represented. We have different uh, uh, arms of the government uh, owning uh, these various agencies, uh, these uh, various water bodies. So some representative from there should certainly be on board. DDA I have suggested because uh, uh, planning uh, around the water bodies is important. And uh, similarly, the local body, uh, which could be the you know, various uh, municipalities or the cantonment board and so on. So these all uh, need to be uh, represented in uh, these committees. Now that may make for very large committees, so, uh, but uh, I'm just putting these ideas on the table. All these things will have to be structured uh, uh, after some uh, debate and consultation. Now, it could be that, uh, you know, see each village has about uh, two to three water bodies. And so we could have perhaps one committee per village uh, that could be um, uh, thought of. Uh, it could be one committee per larger water body. Uh, we would have to look at the number of participants as we were looking in the previous slide. Uh, what could be the criteria for membership? That also needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, uh, what will be the objective for the committee? So in a single line, I feel that, uh, you know, we had laid out the model pond criteria last year. I think uh, Dr. Ritesh and uh, myself, uh, we had submitted uh, uh, some model pond criteria to the wetland authority. And if that is accepted, then I think that should be the uh, objective for these uh, committees. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, you know, the committee would have to have some rules of functioning. So these are, you know, generally set rules, uh, and I think we could just uh, uh, tweak them somewhat so as not to make the, you know, committees very rigid. And there would have to be some assessment of committee working and effectiveness. Now, uh, I uh, uh, recall that uh, Dr. Jay Chandran in his opening remarks was uh, mentioning about the... Uh, you know, uh, great shortage of uh, 
uh, human resource for the wetland authority. And I think uh, that the uh, you know government will have to uh, provide some additional manpower if they you know want to uh, uh, you know manage uh, the working of these committees uh, because there will be a very large number of committees and uh, you know we may like to cap them in order to uh, you know manage uh, uh, the you know numbers but uh, i think we need to certainly have a dedicated uh, wing in the uh, uh, wetland authority to uh, manage these committees uh, because there would be a whole, uh, you know, a very large amount of reporting, and uh, uh, there would be need to, you know, check things on the ground. There may be certain other issues which may arise from time to time, and uh, all that will have to be dealt with. So I think there will be should be a dedicated uh, staff in the wetland authority to manage this aspect. Now, uh, once we have the committees. Uh, and even otherwise for the larger, uh, you know, uh, population, we need to have uh, uh, some kind of training and awareness workshops. Uh, this could be, you know, in the form of uh, uh, well-made uh, brief videos. It could be in the form of uh, actual, you know, training or webinars, or it could be in the form of advertisements, what and uh, you know, posters and uh, some pamphlets and so on. So I think uh, the, what should be the content of these should, of course, uh, first of all, they should all uh, tap the secondary database because there's a huge amount of literature available, both with the official agencies as well as with NGOs who have been working uh, on water bodies. Uh, then, of course, uh, you know the need to understand hydrology and the basin aspect. What kind of uh, in situ and ex situ measures can be taken to manage the health of the water body in terms of quality, in terms of the littoral zone? The, the need, uh, you know, to um, uh, have a balance between beautification and uh, the uh, ecological aspects and hydrological aspects, because so far the uh, emphasis has been on, uh, you know, beautification. Now, beautification does not, uh, you know, is pointless. If you have a, you know, poor or dry or dead water body in the middle of it, so then uh, uh, you know, water testing. How is it to be done? At what intervals it has to be done? Who will test? Who will meet the cost? Uh, how the biodiversity has to be assessed, both within the water and the visiting biodiversity uh, monitoring aspects how the documentation has to be done, how the reporting of all that documentation has to be done, and then what kind of threats may arise and how they need to be uh, tackled. All this has to be um, uh, part of the training. I also feel that once we have that dedicated staff in position, we need to have a wetland uh, web community for Delhi, and uh, on which uh, you know each water body would have a link uh, which could then be, uh, you know, updated by the concerned committee. And uh, what aspects are to be uh, uploaded, all that uh, will need to be decided in advance. There would have to be a standard format, maybe a quarterly, uh, you know, three monthly frequency of uploading, um, you know, not uh, daily issues, unless there is some, you know, very uh, thing significant to report, for example, you know, an unusual or a rare uh, bird sighting and so on, uh, that may, you know, call for an uh, 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 irregular uh, update. Now, in terms of the committee, the members may be given some form of nominal recognition. The committee will, of course, have to be, you know, they can't be permanent. They'll have to be a rotation of members some form of uh, recognition for performance. We'll have to think of those things, uh, some awards or something. And as I've already mentioned, the need for the dedicated staff at uh, the Wetland Authority. So uh, this uh, in brief, uh, I think all this requires, uh, you know, much more work uh, than uh, this is only a brief outline. And of course, everybody would have a view, but I think uh, this could form the core of, uh, you know, uh, getting the stakeholders uh, engagement and the wetland committees formed. Uh, so I think I'll uh, stop over there and uh, look forward to hearing the views of all.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Manuji, for uh, for very very crisp and uh, very great uh, uh, suggestions. You know, you highlighted uh, one the, to begin with. You highlighted the need for uh, uh, generating this awareness and sensitizing people on values of wetlands, value of uh, ecology, hydrology, biodiversity. You highlighted the, the structure of the wetland committees. Uh, you highlighted the the formation, the constitution, and also uh, the need for uh, uh, online web platform for each of these wetlands where people can actually upload data. So there's a lot, lot of food for thought out there, and uh, we will come back to you, um, you know, to detail out some of this in the in the stakeholder plan. And also, you highlighted the need for training workshops on different aspects. So that's also again uh, important. And in fact, uh, this is exactly what uh, we have found in our work in, with the Ganga and the Ram Ganga Mitras. Um, you know, because quite often people come forward because of their passion, and uh, you know, uh, what drives them is, uh, you know, the recognition that they get, um, you know, because of their engagement in conservation of some of these freshwater resources. You also highlighted the need for awards and recognition for some of these. Uh, things as well. So thank you very much for uh, enlightening us with your thoughts on this and we will definitely uh, uh, detail this out in, in, in a conversation with you uh, after, afterwards. Um, thank you so much. And so we'll go on to the next speaker. So we, uh, Neha has texted that she's uh, going to join us in about 15 minutes. So I'll move on to Ashish Loya. Ashish Loya, as I said, he, he is from uh, Bijnor and uh, he works extensively on uh, this wetland called Hyderpur. Uh, it's formed by the Madhya Ganga Barrage and uh, two rivers, Ganga and the uh, Solani. And there is not even a single day when he's not there in the wetland recording the birds. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to invite uh, Ashish. Uh, Ashish's story is inspirational and that's why we thought we'll have him here because a lot of wetland mitras are also here. So Ashish, uh, welcome to this conversation and uh, wanted to hear from you, you know, what inspired you to be a wetland mitra and how you are inspiring I know, individuals to take up the cause of uh, wetland conservation. So over to you and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sureshji, for inviting me. I hope I'm audible and uh, visible clearly. Very clear, uh, yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me to share my thoughts and uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, as you, uh, you asked me how, what inspired me actually. So that it was more uh, my passion for birds uh, that I started birding in the wetland area. And when I stumbled upon this huge untapped uh, area, I was quite surprised. And it was my very first thought that this place deserves to be a Ramsar site, you know, looking at the sheer number of volume of birds and the diversity. So I started birding and visiting the wetland area and exploring it a few years back. And that became a daily habit. And uh, then I chanced upon a few commu local community youth who used to visit the wetland area. They used to practice their running, preparing for army, or they would just play games and stuff like that. So I'm also an art of living faculty, by the way. And um, the way I approached these communities was through an art of living workshop. I gathered them all together and conducted the seven day workshop for them. And as part of this workshop, we actually form a connection to the community. You know, a level of trust gets built up. They, the kind of sense of belongingness develops in that. Uh, these are non-religious and spiritual uh, workshops where you uh, teach them yoga, meditation, and breathing techniques, and also inspire them to uh, take responsibility for themselves and their surroundings. Uh, we, uh, it increases uh, their energy. They get rid of stress. A lot of enthusiasm comes. And we actually channelize that into some constructive project, which uh, benefits the surrounding community. For me, that project naturally was uh, conservation of wetlands and biodiversity. So during the workshop itself, I would uh, introduce them to the concept of biodiversity, wetland, and bird watching. So I remember as we um, would meditate together, and as we were coming out of our meditation, we would focus on listening to all the bird calls in the surrounding. And, um, then we would go on a field trip in the wetland and do bird watching for half an hour, an hour. That kind of created a sense of connection uh, to, for these children. And they got us some structured knowledge about birds. What they, they naturally grew up around in this environment, but they didn't have any structured knowledge about it. And I was very surprised how quickly they 
picked up this as a hobby you know so i felt uh, having this connection to these kind of workshops was very important for me to uh, gain that trust and have a connection and to introduce them to uh, bird watching us uh, also uh, these workshops help us to identify uh, change leaders in the community you know what i realized was if i would directly approach their group of 20 50 people and talk to them about conservation importance of pet plant they would sit there but it would not make so much sense to them but one of their very own when that person goes and talks about it uh, they are in a very different state of mind they they're more receptive to it so these workshops help me identify few youth who i thought could be developed as change leaders and i groom them further Uh, gave them further training in communication skills, leadership skills, and all that. Uh, gave more mentoring to them, and these change leaders are being very effective. Now, like there was a uh, workshop on water testing quality uh, conducted by by WWF at Tiger Pool, and uh, one of the youth there who is now on the board or a nature guide, he managed to get ten people with him. You know, I myself, if I would have gone, I don't think I would have been able to pull all of them together just for this workshop. so i think it's partnering with organizations like art of living or uh, people who do such work that can be very effective way to get community involvement because they cater to different aspects uh, different needs of these uh, youth second thing that i learned about uh, from my experience is that you have to be very consistent in our approach you have to consistently mentor them um, hold their hand or be with them You no know, if i were to have just conducted this workshop and then just met them once a week or once in 15 days i don't think i would have been able to inspire them as much you know uh, the fact that i go there every day every day we would uh, do our practices together and then go on bird watching together that made a lot of difference i think so being consistent and uh, giving sufficient time and focus in mentoring them is very essential the third thing i feel is Uh, what uh, what help us giving uh, as earlier speakers also said uh, giving some kind of an award or recognition i gave a lot of credit to these children and youth for the knowledge that they had uh, they had excellent no uh, local knowledge of the environment and the landscape and the local trail and i created stories out of them and i published uh, i contacted local newspapers and all and they published their stories you know that kind of boosted the self esteem they felt like they were doing something which was being appreciated and it was a hugely inspiring and motivating thing for them uh, some children once spotted a very rare sighting of an eurasian oyster catcher and i made sure it was publicized in their name as much as i could you know so they went back to their schools and their families and they showed their names and photographs in paper and on tv so then the parents started pushing them no you go and learn with bhaiya you do this thing you keep in, keep up with this thing you know at times some some of them were used to be lazy they would not come some day if the parents used to push them then no you have to go you should go uh, and see bhaiya you should go and spend time so recognizing uh, their talent uh, giving them credit not minimizing their contribution in fact i would reward the contribution as even more than uh, what was needed so i went that, that extra mile to do that you know, that because many a times the youth face a lot of peer pressure actually when they try to do something different so uh, they were teased about watching birds spending time uh, doing these things so they were not very comfortable but when these uh, they were started uh, when they started getting recognized for this and there was press coverage and then uh, authorities and other people sought them out that kind of really helped them be comfortable in their role and another thing uh, fourth thing that i feel was played a very big role as well is uh, linking it to some kind of a monetary compensation uh, one of the youth he started working as a nature guide at the wet land and uh, he started earning some money out of it and that made them realize yes this is not just some waste of time and uh, they were getting some reward for the effort and time as well that actually motivated other people in their communities to come forward now they're coming and approaching us and saying we also want to learn we also want to become mitras so uh, because these communities uh, there's a lot of unemployment there's a lot of financial challenges that they face so if we can associate some kind of financial remuneration with their activities uh, that would be also very motivating factor for them to do that uh, so 
I think creating success stories, even one or two, that inspires a lot. So, um, I would say from my experience, the four things, creating change leaders through partnerships with organizations like Art of Living, uh, being consistent in our approach, uh, in our time that we give them and the way we mentor them, uh, then giving due credit for their work and accomplishment, uh, creating a positive supporting environment in that way, and monetary compensation, financial rewards uh, in some way. Uh, so that uh, that also inspires them. So this has been my experience at Heatherpool Wetland because of which I've been able to uh, have some youth inspired and they've become Wetland Mitra. And there are so many more now who want to come forward and learn something. So I will uh, conclude my talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashishji, for explaining this in a very simple manner. And I would also like to share with the audience that you know, you've spent uh, many years in Hyderpur uh, building this. So uh, you made this point on continuous engagement and consistency. Um, and uh, you know, uh, really appreciate your patience and uh, your engagement in Hyderpur and raising its profile out, out there. So thank you so much. And all the points you know you've emphasized. Uh, from change leaders to recognition to consistency are well taken and so we will uh, need your inputs going forward in developing this uh, plan as well so um, i'll move on to the next speaker um, uh, dr ritesh uh, needs no introduction he has been uh, collaborating and supporting the state wetland authority um, as uh, explained by uh, dr jason so uh, ritesh uh, if we can have you right now um, to talk about your experiences uh, in engaging stakeholders in wetland planning as well as conservation, you know, across the, across the country and across the region. And what can Delhi do uh, to build a robust stakeholder engagement plan, which can make a difference to the wetlands? Over to you. Thank you, Suresh. Um, I'll use uh, a few slides to, uh, to bring forth my points. First of all, thank you so much for uh, organizing this important discussion. Are my slides visible, Suresh? Yes, it is. Okay. So a critical challenge that I face today uh, is less about uh, science. It's more about how we communicate and talk about wetlands. Uh, Suresh, for example, uh, even in today's introduction, there are multiple terms used such as water bodies or lakes, ponds. There are n number of ways of describing the ecosystem, but perhaps we should now start about making our messaging consistent. Uh, uh, the biggest challenge uh, that uh, I find is when people say that, you know, we are looking at water bodies. So uh, the, the first point of discourse starts when we start placing wetlands as, uh, you know, ecosystems beyond water bodies. And this is not this is not just being bodies of water, but these are ecosystems in their own right. And when we speak of an ecosystem approach, then their uh, benefits, then their uh, services, the biodiversity functions also need to acquire an equal attention. Now, look at the left hand slide of the uh, side of the slide. This is the kind of language which we normally use. The question that I ask is what difference does it make to policy and decision maker if you call a wetland as a marsh or a floodplain or a pond or a mangrove or, or lake, whatever it is. It's important for ecology, it's important for designing significant strategies, but the core questions that we are dealing today is, uh, uh, is different sectors trying to find their own answers from wetland community and understanding whether uh, conserving this wetland will help me buffer floods or droughts. Can we permit tourism or not? So every day I get n number of calls from agencies like DDA or uh, you know different district functionaries. Kisab, should we permit tourism or not? Should I build this road or not? This is the kind of information that is requested or anticipated of us as on date and perhaps as wetland managers or, or technical advisors, we should start uh, demonstrating or linking wetland management with specific functions, which each sectors are trying to achieve. For example, Delhi Development Authority is talking about sustainable urbanization. Now, what is the place of wetlands in their numerous parks? How can these be put into, you know, built as a natural infrastructure as DDA is trying to, you know, uh, trying to maintain the environs? 
how much groundwater we charge. So, so we should start, stop moving from complex uh, jargon, jargonistic language around wetlands to talking about how is it relevant to different sectors. And perhaps this is the point when we can start taking people on board. I don't, uh, you know, uh, in any ways discount the importance of understanding the ecology. But what I'm saying is it is time to take the next step forward and start talking to different sectors on why investing in wetlands conservation is going to be helpful for a wetland mitra, for a resident, uh, you know, welfare association, for a group of uh, urbanites, for school students and whatnot. So if we start expressing our wetlands in this language, then I think uh, the, the communication starts happening. Now, wetland management uh, is going to be different than protected areas that we are going, we, which we are used with or trying to demarcate an area and assuming that everything that you do inside those boundaries are going to make the wetland healthy. Perhaps nothing is uh, more further from the truth. Uh, and uh, Suresh, uh, your own experience and Bhatnagar Sahib's experience, all of us, we know that wetland management is less about doing within the wetland. It is more about how the catchments are, uh, catchments are maintained or the integrity of catchments are maintained. And in urban systems, unfortunately, catchments are not the ones that we think of hydrologically. These are significantly altered by roads, by buildings. So this catchment, uh, you know, uh, while catchment approaches are important, we should also take into um, cognizance the ground realities of working on catchment approaches. So wise use perhaps still remains a good anchor to talk to different stakeholders on how are we managing wetlands. The fact that it accommodates, uh, you know, species, it accommodates people, it accommodates, uh, you know, development needs in one management framework needs to be communicated. Now, it is good uh, as, as a high level philosophy, but unpacking this for wetland mitras and saying that, you know, we will need to strike a balance in the natural ecosystem. So whatever developmental benefits or ecosystem benefits are being uh, right, which does not lead to modification of ecosystems can be termed as wise use, but this, this needs to be unpacked to all stakeholders and perhaps uh, you know one one job i think one stepping stone is clarifying what are we managing these wetlands for and what does wise use look uh, look like from the eyes of different stakeholder groups that would be an important question to ask the next question then um, i i show this slide within one framework you can see people fishing birds being there and and lot of uh, you know, what is hidden from this picture is a lot of culture, a lot of history that exists in that landscape. Now, to start this dialogue, we will have to create an, a more connected picture of uh, wetland human interactions. Now, these connections can be instrumental, you know, how are livelihoods dependent on wetlands, but these are also about relational values, how people are related to wetlands culturally, their belief systems, their sense of place. I don't think in Nazavgarh Chil, we see it as an ecological entity buffering floods, but talking to people, you know, it's, it's, it's a landscape. It's their connectedness to the landscape that I've seen uh, people staying over and over again around a hazardous place, uh, you know, uh, close to a wetland where floods and droughts, are, uh, where floods, you know, recur. It is that sense of place that also needs to be brought in the same fold as in we are talking about, uh, you know, things such as wetland maps and zones of influence, we'll need to bring that to start a dialogue. And I think Ashish ji has, uh, has actually uh, used the relational linkages of a wetland to the advantage of conservation, which is a perfect example, how we go beyond a, a very deadpan uh, ecosystem uh, language of so many species and, and conservation significance to more understanding why uh, my sense of being is associated with wetlands becomes a quite a big motivator uh, for conservation practices. Now then how do we start describing wetlands? And, and if you get the description of the wetland wrong, uh, uh, I think Suresh, that is where I see most of the management plans or management interventions failing because we describe uh, uh, wetlands in half baked way. The most classical, uh, the, the, the conventional way to describe a, a, a wetland has been in terms of its ecology. 
right we talk about soil water parameters and and maps are uh, used to maps and statistics around this what we forget is that wetlands are living systems it is also about as much about people living around the wetlands as much as the ecosystem itself they are an integral part and unless the social system is defined or um, you know clearly demarcated along with the wetland uh, i think we are not looking at a right wetland model and when you talk of people, how do they engage with wetlands is through their governance choices. Even if it's a resident, uh, you know, welfare uh, association, they, they take certain decisions on their own that we are uh, either suppose a decision not to, you know, leach out waste uh, around, around, the, around their own wetland. Now, these kind of governance decision, whether these are formalized or informalized, that's a separate question, but these need to be taken part and parcel of the system design. And that can be a basis of a robust planning. Uh, I have been saying after 30 years of good wetland science, the problem today is of, uh, is of interpreting that science to enable good decisions. It is more a challenge of governance rather than a science application. Uh, if technological fixes would have solved the problem, I think uh, we have uh, quite an enabling science available with us today. Now, management plans, theoretically have been seen as instruments of uh, you know raising resources that is how governments have been reaching us to wwf and to manu bhatnagarji that help us put in a management plan so that we know what kind of resources are required what i have been saying is look at management plan as an opportunity to do several things including the regulation which is first and foremost but also it is about establishing baselines it is also about communicating to stakeholders what do we mean by wetland management and how does it look like it is also about resolving conflicts it is also about setting management objectives and not just the objectives of the government agency which is dealing with the wetland these objectives are societal objectives they, they, these are expressions of what a wetland mitra sees or or desires from the wetland and it is also an instrument to raise resources so if we expand the scope of management planning per se to solve multiple functions, I think we are looking at a more inclusive approach to management planning. Now, the Ministry of Environment has uh, laid out a diagnostic approach to do a management plan. It starts with setting out why we are doing a, uh, doing a management plan to how we are describing a wetland, evaluating a wetland, setting priorities, identifying what needs to be done and review and adaptation. Now, there are two ways to do this. One is that you can use a lot of GIS maps, limited ecological data to do this, and a plan would be prepared. The other thing is to take this whole diagnostic approach in a more stakeholder inclusive way. So when you do a goal and purpose setting, let this goal and purpose also encapsulate sitting with wetland mitras on why do they see management as relevant. When we describe a wetland, let us describe it not just using ecological information, but also using the information mitras have allowing them an, an opportunity to learn from uh, you know from different stakeholder groups on what the wetland is what does it do the evaluation process and at every stage uh, suresh i would say there is a role an important significant role of wetland mitras and stakeholder groups to support management planning at the end it is not about the technical fineness of the document it is about social acceptability and social relevance of the management plan which will decide uh, whether the plan is successful or not and finally uh, what we have been saying uh, is to demystify the eight step and ask some five basic questions when we start management planning what is the wetland like why is it degrading what are the goals and objectives how do we, uh, what kind of institutions are, are, are uh, required to implement the management and what should the management look like? Let this be the beginning of any management discourse. Let's not attempt to write the whole management plan at the first step. Let us start it with a basic dialogue with wetland mitras on what does the wetland look like? How did it look like 30 years back? Why is it changing? And you can start defining an inclusion and engagement process around the management planning template which can then the framework can be expanded if the need be into a more sophisticated document which the ministry um, uh, has uh, you know recommended uh, i'll stop showing the slides but i also had a couple of uh, points when we describe a wetland or when we map a wetland 
Uh, it is also important to understand the rights and privileges around wetlands. I think the biggest engagement point is to see uh, wetland boundaries also as an expression of what do these boundaries mean for people. And let us try, this is going to be a complex exercise, but unless we have the rights and privileges understood and how does management enable or even try to alter these rights and privileges, it is important to build in a stake, uh, a stake of people in the management planning processes. And finally, coming on uh, the governance dimension, our learning from management journey thus far is that formalized and informal governance arrangements need to work together. Uh, formal systems of having uh, the office of uh, Dr. Jayachandran, uh, the wetland authority of NCT uh, is, is uh, the formal side of it, which gives the legal architecture on where and who is responsible for wetland management. The informal gives social inclusion. The wetland mitras need to be informally, even in some sense need to be linked, need to be accredited within the management planning system. The ones they take the oath of wetland mitra, uh, we can also create a mechanism wherein we assess how much uh, are they adhering to their terms of reference, how much input they are giving to the management planning process that would provide them a sense of ownership. Any management plan needs to be owned by the stakeholders. And I find a management plan written by wetland mitras being one of the best role models that we can create from uh, in city of Delhi. Um, NGOs and civil society organizations like yours and ours can all be enablers and we can empower wetland mitras in setting up a course, uh, a future for their um, own system, Suresh. So that was all that I wanted to bring on board. Hope this was useful. Over to you, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you, Ritesh, uh, for a very enlightening uh, presentation and also the great inputs that you're, you're providing. And I just wanted to start with what you said. You know, management planning has to be an inclusive process. And, you know, this is what I tried to highlight in the beginning that we need to have shared vision. And that vision has to originate from the stakeholders who uh, own the wetland, who, who belong to that wetland. And uh, we have some experiences, uh, you know, from the Ganga as well as from uh, from the South, you know, where the key question, you know, you, you highlighted the key uh, around communications. Okay, when you articulate what is in it for me to, you know, keep a wetland a wetland, you know, that sort of uh, helps us tide over half the journey. You know, when, you, when the stakeholders are convinced, you know, then your journey is going to be smooth. And this happened in a very uh, groundwater critical area of Karnataka, you know, where people realized the importance of wetland in recharge of groundwater. They came together. They, uh, industries, the government departments, local uh, uh, communities, they came together to, to revive that wetland. And after 15 years, that wetland got revived. And I think that that's, that's the beauty of what you articulated that, you know, wetland mitras, when they actually come together to help us in the diagnostics and also find solutions. Okay, so many, many solutions, as you said, are not within the wetland, but outside. And uh, those are also societal choices. And how do you want, motivate and facilitate this conversation is something that, that's very, very important. And we are looking at building some of this in the stakeholder engagement plan that we are, we are discussing today. You also uh, talking about, talk, and you know, through the presentation, what you've been trying to, uh, connect, you know, highlight was the people better and connect, you know, and, and how do you strengthen those interactions, those relationships, and thank you for uh, highlighting that, and the importance of how both, uh, and, and why both formal and informal institutions and structures need to interact and work together, so uh, thank you, and uh, we will keep this conversation going, uh, and, and we'll need your inputs in building this uh, plan. Um, Neha uh, uh, Sinha has joined, and uh, Thank you, Neha, for joining despite having uh, um, fever over uh, uh, the night. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, just wanted to hear from you, Neha, because you had been an, uh, our, you know, uh, an advocate of community-based conservation and you had been writing on issues around wetlands. Um, and uh, so wanted to hear from you, you know, how do you, how do you see uh, this stakeholder engagement in, in uh, wetlands around Delhi, how do, how do you see those uh, um, uh, evolving or a period of time? How, what opportunities exist in terms of engaging uh, stakeholders in biodiversity monitoring and conservation? So your thoughts and experiences. 
Thank you for having me. And I apologize for coming late. I've just recovered from COVID and I keep getting fever again and again. I'm just going to make a short presentation. Are you able to see? Yes. Okay. So um, I work for the Bombay Natural History Society and a lot of our work is to do with um, water birds, uh, birds in general, but water birds and uh, wetlands, which are important bird areas. So not all important bird areas are wetlands, but it's, it's important that we should all understand that wetlands are extremely important for biodiversity, for birds, even for mammals. And uh, you know, if you if we begin to uh, see how animals move across the landscape, if we try to understand movement ecology, then a lot of that movement is motivated by the search for water. So whether it's herds of elephants, whether it is uh, uh, mammals like leopards or tigers, they a lot of their movement is to do with where they can get water. How many uh, wetlands are there for them to access? Sometimes it's a river, sometimes it's a wetland. And so usually it's not just one wetland that becomes important when we talk about uh, uh, wildlife or biodiversity, but basically all the wetlands in the landscape and how the wetlands are distributed and you know how um, uh, that influences uh, the landscape. So, you know, for wetland mitras, which is such a great concept because, you know, wetlands are so important in the fact that they have a lot of people around them. People use wetlands. Wetlands are not places that are just for wildlife or just for conservation. Wetlands are places with multiple uses. And there's so many actors in a wetland setup. So there'll be the local community. There will be people who may have a commercial interest in fishing. There may be people who are artisanal fishers. There may be people who are using the wetland for irrigation of their fields. Uh, this, for example, is Basai wetland in uh, Delhi NCR. It's near Gurgaon. You can see the high rises uh, behind. And this area is used uh, for fishing. It's a private area. You can also see the water hyacinth, but it's also an important bird area. You have almost 300 bird species coming here. And so this is a very typical example of a wetland where you have a little bit of commercial activity, you have people uh, utilizing uh, the waters, you also have birds and wildlife and biodiversity, and you also have uh, people living around the wetland sometimes, you know, uh, very close uh, to the wetland. So. Uh, uh, I just wanted to set uh, the tone for why wetlands become very important for birds and biodiversity. So we have these flyways, which are basically routes in the sky that birds take. And uh, if you see this map of the world, uh, the, the light green one is the Central Asian flyway, which is uh, where we are in India. So you have a migration from North, um, you know, Europe, uh, Central Asia, the North Pole towards the South every year. So every year in winter, these birds come. Birds are not the only thing that migrate. Mammals also migrate. Whales also migrate. But um, I'm just going to focus on birds and tell you a little bit about how wetland mitras can help. So for example, this is a map of a migration of the bar-headed goose, which is a bird that comes from Tibet or Central Asia to India and to Delhi every year. Uh, in this photograph, you can see uh, different kinds of birds, and this is Najavgar wetland in Delhi. So, uh, you know, the uh, in the middle, you see these flamingos, uh, greater flamingos, and right in front, there's a line of birds. Those are the bar-headed goose, and they've all come from uh, the places I mentioned. They would have come from Tibet or uh, Central Asia and they're coming here to Najafgarh every year. So, you know, I'm always interested in, uh, before me, the speaker spoke about what is the ownership that we have, you know, how can we understand how people experience uh, wetlands? And, you know, I think we can only um, value something if we know the name of that thing. 
and if we know that it comes there. So a lot of the times local communities have a lot of information about which bird is coming to a wetland, for example. Uh, they may not know the specific name, but they know that it comes. And uh, many there are many wetlands in India where people have relationships with, with the migratory birds that come. So for example, in Andhra Pradesh is a place called Tili Nilapuram, where the people are actually feeding the birds and helping the birds nest as well in their villages. This is a common crane. A crane Crane species are respected by many cultures across the world, including Indian culture. And the common crane actually comes to Delhi as well. So this is a wetland again near Najafgarh, and this is a group of uh, common cranes that I found uh, uh, there in winter. And I just want to move quickly to what wetland mitras can do uh, for wetlands um, and to understand wetlands better. So uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of birds of wetlands actually go inside the water, like this common crane in which they are seen in the water. But wetlands are also important for other kinds of birds that are not water birds. So for example, this is a bio weaver. Uh, it makes this beautiful nest. Uh, this is the male on the, on the right. And on the left is, are all the nests that it's made. It will be right next to a wetland. And if we monitor the nests of this bird, uh, it is a valuable contribution to our society and to science as well. So this is a uh, this is a map of uh, Najafgarh Jhil. Many of us were part of a committee for Najafgarh Jhil. And over here, you see right in the middle is the water body, the wetland, the Jhil uh, in the middle, which is seen this kind of sickle shape. And actually there's a state boundary that runs through it. So most of the water is in Haryana and some of the water is in Delhi. So some of the, you know, some of the, uh, uh, recommendations that the expert committee had was to prohibit many activities like solid waste dumping, not having manufacturing over there, not having a heavy industry over there. But you know, another aspect of this is, you know, how do we bring in the community? How do we get them to uh, use the wetland in a way that is sustainable and also use the wetland in a way that it doesn't harm, uh, do any ecological damage to the character of the wetland. And uh, before me, Ritesh spoke about you know uh, also the area around the wetland how that also becomes important people live near wetlands and they're used to flooding in certain instances and they have a certain way of life but all of this can be done if we try to understand what we are dealing with so he spoke about uh, how we name and recognize wetlands i want to speak a little bit about what we can contribute as citizen scientists as wetland mitras so this is a fabulous example of citizen science uh, this is the first bird atlas that has been done in India. Uh, this is the state of Kerala. So when I say bird atlas, it is simply um, documenting where different birds are found in different parts of the state. So they've actually made this atlas for the entire state. It's all, all been done by volunteers who are citizen scientists. Uh, it's just come out, uh, just been published. And as you can see uh, on the top of uh, the slide, there's so many different uh, organizations that are a part of it. And uh, there's also the Indian Bird Conservation Network, which is um, uh, coordinated by Bombay Natural History Society. There's also WWF over there. So basically, all these people are normal, uh, ordinary citizens who have come together to uh, document which bird they see near them. And because of that, they have created an atlas showing which bird is found in which part of Kerala. This is something that can also be done in Delhi. If not for all of Delhi, this is something that we can do for the wetlands of Delhi. So where are the wetlands? Which are the birds found in the wetlands? How far are they found? Are they in the wetland, around the wetland? And it can be done by a wetland mitras. So for example, another example of uh, citizen science and wetland uh, friends of wetlands, these are greater flamingos in Yamuna River. And, uh, you know, every year uh, in Okla, after it rains, uh, there are a lot of birds that come. There are a lot of birds there right now as well. And there are a lot of citizens who are interested in monitoring these areas, in, in seeing what all is there in the water, what wildlife is there, and making lists of, of uh, this wildlife. So, for example, this is another 
Indian Bird Conservation Network member. This is Wild Orissa. And they're doing a survey on Mahanadi River of Orissa to see what are the different birds that they can find. And in a way, they are also wetland mitras because their entire purpose is to document the area and to see what all is found. And then when they do the survey every year, they're able to see the changes that happen. Uh, are there the same birds coming? What are the wildlife that they see? What are the threats that they see? So once we understand what is there, once we understand uh, uh, what all is available or what are the threats, we can do something for management. So these are the actions that can be taken by wetland mitras. I've given you the example of Urissa and Kerala, little bit of Delhi also. We do have little bit, but not too much. So we can do site monitoring, that is monitoring our local wetland to see how it's doing. You know, What are the things uh, that are happening over there? Are there any major changes that are coming? Are there any, you know, threats uh, that are coming? Is the threat immediate? Is it long term? Immediate threat would be, for example, a dustbin has been made in a wetland. So in many parts of India, wetlands are used as dustbins. Deepur Beel in Assam, Guwahati is an example. Palikarnia in Chennai is another example, where municipal waste goes inside wetlands. So that would be an immediate threat. Long term threat could be maybe, uh, you know, uh, the catchment area is drying up or something like that. So when we monitor the site, we are able to uh, understand what all is happening. Second is nest monitoring. You know, it's possible to find species that are uh, there. It's also interesting. It's a wonderful thing to monitor nests because we all like to, you know, see, uh, you know, nests and uh, chicks and, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, a mother feeding uh, the chicks and something coming up. So I showed you the buyer nests, for example, there are many other uh, nests, uh, many birds, uh, and I can give you, help you with a, a list of species that we can monitor. It's also nice to um, understand the linkages between rivers and wetlands. So for example, uh, Najavka Jheel is part of the Sahibi River. I showed you Mahanadi in uh, Urissa. That's another example. They look at both the river and the wetlands. And finally, you know, if we work at this, uh, uh, we can create knowledge products in any language. You know, it could be uh, Hindi, it could be English, it could be any language that is uh, appropriate. So like Kerala has done making a bird atlas, making bird lists, making mammal lists and tracking the migration also. And sometimes, you know, birds that have come also do short migrations between wetlands or between states. So for example, the bar-headed geese that I showed you that have come to Najafgarh will move from Najafgarh to Basai, which is in Haryana. So from Delhi to Haryana, they'll move, then they'll go to Sultanpur again in Haryana. Or they may move to Uttar Pradesh and Sursar over uh, a Jheel in Agra. So you know, uh, the more wetland mitras we have, and uh, we have scientific assessment protocols, which I'm happy to share, and uh, scientific site monitoring protocols also. Uh, the more we do it, the more often we do it, uh, the more updated our information can be. And it can be a very valuable contribution to citizen science. And finally, I'll end by saying that um, India is part of the Convention on Migratory Species. And in the last meeting of the Convention on Migratory Species, it was decided that India will be the focal point for the entire flyway. So a lot of the migratory birds that are there in India, we are supposed to be actually coordinating the work for, for all the countries. So wherever, whichever country the bird is coming from, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, China, etc., we are supposed to be coordinating the work. So the work that a wetland mitra does can actually, you know, add to this national work that India is supposed to do. The national reporting we are supposed to do as part of this uh, uh, decision by the CMS. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neha. I'm happy to take thank questions if you. Yeah, thank you, Neha, for outlining the opportunities for engagement, but also most importantly, what you said is around building this data sets, which will be very, very critical for conservation. And, uh, you know, th this was discussed earlier also that there is a shortage of capacity at the. Uh, 
I'll just request my colleagues to mute everyone right now. So one of the things that we discussed about was also the lack of capacity at uh, the government level to monitor all the wetlands. So probably a decentralized form in terms of wetland mitras who are, who are trained on monitoring of birds, water quality, and other things can give us valuable insights on how a wetland is behaving. So thank you, Neha for a very, very sharp presentation and clearly outlining, you know, what we could actually start with the Mitras tomorrow, you know, so it's kind of an action oriented presentation and thank you so much. And I think we will look forward to uh, collaborating with you and BNHS in taking this sure. uh, forward. Sure. Um, now uh, we have, uh, we can take uh, two or three questions and I, I, I was told that there are a few uh, wetland Mitras who have also joined um, you know, who has been registered under uh, uh, the State Wetland Authority of Delhi in on the call. So if uh, there are questions, uh, we can take two to three questions. Kindly introduce yourself and please be brief. And I'll then request the panelists to, um, you know, respond and, uh, um, you know, and answer your questions. <coughs> so, yeah, I have one iPad. Hands up. iPad. Yeah, if you could introduce yourself and uh, keep uh, switch on your video. And uh, yeah. Share your question. Share video. Uh, yeah, may I speak? Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, hi, my name is Anita. Uh, I've also signed up as a wetland mitra and have uh, received confirmation of the same through the through an email. Uh, well, uh, to clarify, I didn't apply individually. I, we actually applied on behalf of the Delhi Bird Group, which is a bird watching group based in Delhi. Uh, we've been part of the Delhi bird watching scene for more than two decades. Uh, since the early 2000s. So in response to some of the points that were raised at the discussion, I'd like to make two points. One is uh, we are asking you to include uh, groups like Delhi Bird as part of the resources because we have so many bird watchers who've been making counts, who've been monitoring bird populations in all of these areas for many years. Uh, so we could help uh, work across many of these larger wetlands as well as smaller groups to maintain data and so we're asking us to asking you to take us on board as a resource for this whole initiative in that aspect. Uh, the second thing where place where I see we, go, we could also help would be to train other mitras in identifying birds and you know doing small workshops for them because that's a uh, that's a kind of skill that we have which we're happy to impart to others. And um, that, and of course, what Neha talked about in terms of the Atlas, it's a brilliant project to take up once we have a network of people spread across, you know, Delhi uh, to come up with our own bird Atlas for Delhi, because then we'll have, you know, we'll have the capacity to be able to track the data. And there are enough people who will be able to help us transpose the, 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 the good practices that they have got in the Kerala model over here. And um, the last thing is more of a question. I mean, uh, one thing I noticed is that no one talked about river wetlands. Why are we not talking about the Yamuna and all the Delhi part of the Yamuna as part of this wetland plan? Thank you. So thank you, Anitaji, and uh, thank you for uh, offering to help and be part of this uh, initiative. And, uh, uh, you know, both the points taken in terms of training as well as you being part of uh, this uh, group who will help the state wetland authority on the, the last part you know why we are not talking about uh, delhi uh, the river and the wetlands uh, this we thought this discussion will just focus on the stakeholder engagement strategy and we are not getting into the technicalities of uh, wetlands and uh, over the last week ritesh and many other colleagues who are here you know there had been a lot of discussions and debates on uh, river wetland connect and so on and so forth so this is not to say that we are not we are excluding rivers and wetlands and oxbow lakes. So that's not the purpose of this call um, and, and the meeting. So I'll move on to the next question. If there is anyone who uh, has a point or a question for any of the panelists. I can't see any, uh, any questions or queries, I think. Yeah. So. Um, Manju ma'am had to drop off because she had to go off uh, for a briefing with the secretary. So uh, we will, uh, uh, I'll try and, I'm not trying to wrap up the, uh, the discussions here, but before I uh, do a quick summary on the next steps, uh, I wanted to request if any of the panelists want to have a quick response to any other panelists' points, Manuji, uh, Ritesh, 
Ashish, uh, Neha, or Ritesh, uh, any of you want to make a last uh, comment before we hand over to uh, Dr. Jayajantra? Uh, Suresh, uh, some uh, quick observations. So, uh, Wetland Mitras is uh, perhaps one of the most formidable attempts in the recent times to take management uh, from beyond government and beyond experts to men to you know move uh, to get people on board on wetlands management and success of this venture lies in creating a transparent system on on data and information that we use for taking policy decisions and programming on wetlands so the barest and simplest thing uh, to be done is to create uh, to place the wetland inventory in a form which is assimilable which is usable by the stakeholders on a pub public platform the information on 1400 odd wetlands uh, which has been um, inventoried by the league government needs to be placed on a public domain now we have seen uh, governments uh, being slightly shaky on on um, on on the information on wetlands for the basic reason that uh, you know there are errors or there are omissions or um, you know there are the the, the, uh, the confidence is is not that high and, and thereby i've seen um, inventories being challenged so with the inventory there has to be a process of feedback so inventory is an input from spatial information or whatever limited field investigation but we should given an opportunity for citizens to connect to this uh, whole whole database and improve it uh, on a daily basis if the shorelines are wrong or uh, if the if the shorelines need to be updated if the name uh, you know is different we we should create uh, a platform to engage but also to um, I'll encourage Delhi government to build a bridge with the government so anybody who has uh, some suggestions or recommendations on wetlands management. So they should have a way to reach out to the government and we should be simple, uh, which should be, uh, which should be, uh, you know, easily, e easy to connect. And finally, uh, one way to start this is to have a series of uh, monthly dialogues with citizen groups. You know, uh, in the days of electronic interface, what if we have a wetland samvad? Uh, every month or every once in two months and let this be an open um, open house discussion not uh, you know trying to uh, pin the blame just on governments but as you know a citizen with governments being a part and parcel of the whole trusteeship that they hold let us start this dialogue uh, say once every two months to understand what does wetland management mean and what how how uh, can we make management more relevant and effective and finally, uh, Suresh, the health card data is also an important information that citizens should know. Um, a, a basic quick uh, assessment of wetland ecosystem health and how does that health progress over the time frame of uh, you know, engagement uh, on a longer term would be very useful to bring uh, confidence on people to make them see some real time change um, in the condition of wetlands. Thanks, Suresh. So thank you, uh, thank you, Ritesh, for that uh, quick intervention, particularly on the point of uh, transparency, and also what you highlighted is the the feedback loop, uh, and th that's what uh, Neha was also trying to uh, talk about. You know how local community stakeholders, Mitras, can contribute to the knowledge base and help us uh, build a uh, case. Um, and you the idea of add to uh, that, just to yeah. add to that, Suresh. Yeah, Neha. Um, yeah. Um, you know, uh, we should probably work on a format for getting information from the wetland mitras, which is to do with health of the wetland, as well as the threats, as well as the birds, you know, all our different expertise and just carrying on also from Anita's point, we do have a very large and very qualified pool of bird watchers in Delhi. So it kind of makes it easy in many ways for Delhi to do this work very in a very sophisticated manner. So perhaps we can agree on a format to collect information. And as Ritesh said, very valuable suggestion that we need to take feedback on the format also. So like an adaptive format, it's not set in stone. We can do it for six months and then maybe take some suggestions on it. And I just wanted to add over here that there was an NGT uh, appointed expert committee on Yamuna and they had actually made a website uh, in which they were taking feedback uh, from citizens of Delhi and they also made a report uh, which has some general observations on wetlands so I think it's worth looking at that and uh, you know we can also carry on that model 
again, carrying on from Ritesh's point of actually taking feedback and making a bridge between government and wetlands. A lot of the questions about wetlands are very basic, which the government can answer. So we work on this format together, keep it open for feedback, and also try to create a website or a sort of a bridge uh, in which people can also uh, give their uh, views directly to the government. Yeah, thanks, Neha. In, in fact, uh, this is one of the points that was highlighted by Manuji as well in his uh, talk to put things, uh, the data information on a web platform where people can actually feed in data. And uh, yeah, your point on the format, again, yeah, let's work together to develop that. And there are many formats that uh, WBF, Wetland International, we have contributed to in terms of uh, helping Mitras map the wetland health. So we'll work with you, Belly Bird Group, to develop uh, that for the birds. And you already have formats, so we can actually roll it out. And as you rightly said, you know, because uh, Delhi has great birders, um, you know, it may be very, very easy for us to sort of reach out to all the wetlands in no time. Uh, you know, when you decentralize that. Model. Thank you. And uh, once again, very, very rich uh, discussions. As I said, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to even, uh, uh, you know, summarize this, a lot of good points. Uh, but what we are trying to do is in the next one month, come up with a stakeholder engagement plan based on all the inputs that uh, all the uh, panelists and others have given. And we will share it back with you for your uh, feedback and then want to sort of put it out. And one of the things that we are looking at is, uh, you know, build the capacity and uh, of, of all the mitras who have en enrolled and also broaden the, the number of uh, wetland mitras to cover all the wetlands uh, in, the, in the city and the state of Delhi. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll uh, um, hand over to Dr. Jayatsindran for his concluding remarks and I uh, want to thank all the panelists. Um, uh, Mr. Manu Bhatnagar, uh, Neha Sinha, Pritesh, Ashish, um, and Manju ma'am was there, but uh, she had to leave. And, and also last but not the least, Dr. Jayajindran for the opportunity to collaborate. And we are really looking forward to working with all of you and the authority to take this conversation forward. Uh, thank you, you Sureshi. Thank you, Sureshi. So there, is some, uh, there are certain uh, queries in the chat box. So shall I just uh, read out to uh, elicit some responses from the panelists? So one is from Mr. Uh, Rajesh Bajpai. It's saying how we protect our birds from pesticides which comes in wetlands through agriculture runoff. <laughs> Any of the panelists would like this question? I mean, it's there in the chat box from Rajesh Bajpai. So can I uh, can I respond to that? Uh, yeah, please, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, question, and uh, agriculture yes. uh, also offers us a great opportunity for conservation of uh, uh, wetlands as well as uh, ecosystems. So what we have done in uh, Uttar Pradesh and other places is to promote um, sustainable agriculture practices, a package of practices which are non-pesticide you know, to reduce the impact of pesticides. For instance, uh, uh, the organic manure, organic bio uh, pesticides, which have been um, proven to enhance crop water productivity. So two, two wins, one chemical input reduces and second, the water consumption uh, reduces. So there are, there are these models which are available and uh, which can be adopted. And the uh, input cost go goes down and the productivity goes up. So there is a win-win for the farmers as well as uh, for the ecosystems. So there are these models which uh, we can also share with you and others uh, to look at. Uh, there's a second uh, question. Uh, how can an individual uh, do his or her bit to protect wetland? The actions mentioned by the speakers are all group activities. Uh, uh, Manu, 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 yeah, please go on. Manu. Actually, I just wanted to add to the answer of the previous question. Uh, one thing is that, uh, you know, as uh, in my uh, talk, I had mentioned that uh, we should be concentrating upon. Uh, 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 upon ecology and uh, hydrology rather than beautification. Now, when we do that, then the uh, littoral area of the wetland uh, would have, uh, you know, riparian grasses or uh, natural vegetation, which in turn acts as a biofilter. So, which filters out some of the uh, undesired uh, chemicals from entering into the wetland. But in the context of Delhi's wetlands, I would say that agriculture is uh, a land use which is now becoming extinct. Uh, from the uh, uh, map of Delhi. 
and I do not uh, see how uh, you know we will have uh, any large amounts or significant amounts of pesticides from agriculture entering into our uh, wetlands. So thank you so much, Manuji. Any other panelists would like to uh, have a go at it? Okay. Uh, so if uh, if uh, there are no further questions, then I thank all the panelists, eminent panelists here, uh, for this wonderful discussions. I think we got uh, good indicators on how uh, wetland mitras uh, should be put into action. There is a very rich network. Ninety-one is not a mean number; it's a huge number. So ninety-one mitras for a small space of thousand four hundred square kilometer of Delhi. It's a huge number. So kind of I think we should uh, put this rich network into um, action. And this particular engagement plan would be really useful uh, towards the direction. And I thank Suresh Babuji also to kind of, I mean, uh, kindly um, consented to moderate this session. And we will kind of draft an incipient uh, document on uh, what our plan is, uh, the manner in which we can engage Mitras towards long-term conservation of wetlands, be it in different pillars like awareness campaigns or helping the current collecting data or doing biodiversity surveys or birding. So in different categories of actually, we'll just uh, seek uh, the consent of the wetland mitras and then put them into that particular activity in which, and we'll give all the support from the wetland authority for um, their interaction with the concerned departments. So having said that, I thank uh, Suresh Babuji again, all the uh, panelists, Madam uh, Manju, Madam Neha, Sri uh, uh, Manu Padnaka, Sri uh, Dr. Ritesh Kumar uh, for coming over here and uh, taking part participating in this wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. And I wish you a belated happy uh, World Wetland Day again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.